Welcome to Change Food Eats. Our guest today is Sam Van Aken. Sam is a contemporary artist who works beyond traditional modes of art making, crossing artistic genres and disciplines to develop new perspectives on themes like communication, botany, agriculture, climatology, and the ever increasing impact of technology. He's very smart. Van Aken's interventions in the natural and public realm are seen as metaphors that serve as the basis of narrative, sites of placemaking, and in some cases even become the basis of scientific research. He's very, very smart. Sam lives and works in Syracuse, New York, where he currently is an associate professor in the School of Art at Syracuse University. Sam Van Aken, how are you? Good. Um, well, yeah, I mean, well, after the weekend, I think I'm much, much better. Although I'm still just like in this, you know, waiting for the other shoe to drop with the election or something. So, but how are you? You know what? I'm in the same boat. I, and just for anybody who's watching after the fact, we're recording this a few days after the election um, or after the results of the election were announced. Um, worst four days, five days till Saturday. I was, I literally had walked out to run errands and I turned the corner and this, everyone outside this coffee shop just burst into cheers. And I'm like, oh my God, they announced. Like you didn't even have to look at your phone. You know, and New York just went crazy. So, yeah. but there's reality. I mean, we still have a completely messed up system. There's, yeah. you know, are all these things they claim are going to be addressed, be addressed. But anyway, we are not talking politics. Okay. We are talking <laughs> Sam Van Aken. All day Sam Van Aken. What are you oh, eating? That's terrifying. Okay, so <laughs> leading up to this, I was like, what's the most unique thing in my refrigerator? So I made Scrapple. All right, I don't Ooh. know if you know what that is. I'm a vegetarian. Ugh. Oh, God, yeah, you wouldn't like Scrapple at all. No, so. I know people love it, though. I know people love it. Yeah, well, it's more, um, I think it's also kind of like a memory thing for me because my family, we used to make it. And it's Ooh. like, yeah, that's actually, yeah. So, because we used to- Where is well, it? Wait, you got to show it. You have to show it off. Okay, you want to see Scrapple? Okay. Of course. I don't know if you can see it. Right there it is. I, so this is like a total like Pennsylvania farm breakfast thing. So that's the Scrapple. I met an Amish guy that bakes bread. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. And then of course you have eggs on the side. So yeah, that's, that's my that meal. That looks fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so feel free to eat while talking. We don't care okay. if food falls out. You just do whatever makes you comfortable. Some people eat, some people don't. Jimmy Carbone was the best. He's shoving peanut butter bread down, like peanut butter on toast, Ooh, just peanut... eating away the whole really? time. All right. I'm yeah, but it was it She-Wolf. Then. It was, yeah, no, do your thing. All right. Um, Okay, now, but I'm asking everyone this question, and we're going to start off with this before we jump into really who you are and what you do. Okay. How can we create a How can we create a food system where everyone can have healthy food? I, yeah, I mean that that is the question. Um, I think it, you know from from what I've found, and it you know, it, it's I think it's just getting people to grow food. So I do, it, it's kind of interesting with the project, you know, the couple of projects that I've worked on with fruit trees. Um, We're getting to I, that in a second, everyone. We're going to go into detail about salmon as fruit trees. So I, I, do, I do a lot of school visits. Like it, mm. it's kind of interesting because, you know, I always, you know, thought that my artistic practice was for elite New York gallery. And now I'm finding it's, it's like eight year olds are very rewarding to talk to. <laughs> They're more than a gallerist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I didn't say that. You can't but. say that. I can say that. I can say that. <laughs> um, but I'm surprised just how many kids have never grown a plant, right? right. Where it's this, right. You know, and it, just to take a seed, put it into soil, whatever that plan is, and watch it grow, tend to it. And so it's not surprising when people are so detached from their food that everything just shows up packaged. And right. so so for me, it's, it, you know, it really is comes down to getting involved. And I think you become much more aware of, of everything. I grew... A, uh, garden for the first time in years um you know during how'd it go 
went great. Like I had a bumper crop of tomatoes. Like I couldn't stay on top of it. It was outrageous. But I, I, I did all heirlooms and um, wow, you know, and it the taste is just so different. Yeah. So yeah. I'm anal about terminology, just in case there's someone. So how do you define heirloom? Like what is the heirloom? Pre, to someone who doesn't pre 1945. You know, that, that's, yeah, because uh, 1945 is really seen, you know, at the end of World War II, that's when the food system became industrialized right. because, right. yeah, the government realized they didn't have a dependable food source for our next world war. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Is that true? Yep. <sighs> Don't you and also me. that's that's where all of the, you know, pesticides, so, pesticides, but also you know, you look at our food supply after 1945 and you see tons of sugar and tons of fat yeah. in the food, which is yeah. great for an army, you know, that's marching all day, but yeah, doesn't seem to okay. work too well with <laughs> sitting in front of Zoom. <laughs> yeah. I know. Should I tell you, should I tell you, I didn't have the best day yesterday, so I had two cupcakes. It's like, oh, I could just eat cupcakes all week long. Mm, I know. Sounds great. Um, Okay, so you have a really interesting background. You're an artist. I don't know if you call yourself a farmer, but I call you a farmer. And you're an associate professor at an art university. So how did all three come about? And like, what, what, what was it? I'm actually fascinated by artists. So what was it that prompted you to go into art? I have farming. Um, <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, I grew up on a, <laughs> dairy farm wow. and it's I it's that was brutal right you know it's mm. I feel like I've been retired since I was a teenager um since it you really, left yeah since I left I've been retired since I was in my teens um it, it, it we were a, we had a family farm so we would milk a couple hundred cows a day and then wow. um farmed several hundred acres and so you would get up at 4.30 in the morning, milk cows, go to school, go to work at, an, like, you know, family members would go work another job, come back, milk cows at night, you know, and you, you'd finish up about 8.30 or 9, and then you just start all over again. And yeah, that's people don't understand. Week. People do not understand how hard farming is. I mean, they really don't. Yeah, I but planted, I, think I planted garlic for half a day. I'm never going to be a farmer. That's all I need. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> I, dairy farming is like, you know, other farmers look at dairy farmers and they're like, whoa, that's a lot of work. <laughs> you know? Wow. And so little reward. Okay. So, so you're dairy farming. Yeah. You're at, at, at a underage. Yeah. Child labor time of your yeah. life. Oh yeah. No, I, I would get it. <laughs> That was the funny thing. I was in my teens and I realized I was like, I get 20 bucks a week. I'm like, this doesn't seem like minimum wage. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, so the one thing though is that I always would draw. And I think the other thing too, um, like my parents, they worked, they went to night school to get degrees because they saw the future um, you know, a lot of, you know, kind of the 1980s, a lot of farms, yeah. family farms couldn't make it. Right. Um, so they saw the writing on the wall. So they were, you know, going to night school, going to college, working other jobs. And, um, I think one of the, I was really young, I think it was like seven or eight. And, um, they took me to a Van Gogh exhibition at the Philadelphia art museum. And it wow. was like all of those exhibitions, it was super packed. I couldn't see anything. And my dad put me on his shoulders and I looked at the work, you know, over top of people's heads. And that, I think the whole of that experience really kind of drove me to be interested in art. And then I would mm -hmm. just draw constantly. And then, you know, you, you, you're like, I don't want to get into farming. What's the polar opposite? And that seemed like <laughs> art. And, there you go. So, so at the Van Gogh exhibit, was Starry Night there? 
I don't remember. You were young. Yeah. So it's it's just weird you brought up Van Gogh because like Van Gogh's not even in my top five, but I go to MoMA at least once a month and Starry Night is there and I walk in the room and it blows my mind, just blows yeah. my mind. So I can totally relate to why that would impact you so much. And to anyone, you see the posters, you see the coffee cups and the calendars yeah. and all the Van Gogh, everything. But when you go into a museum and you stand in front of like the real one and you're like, oh my God, this is the real one. It's mind blowing. Yeah, yeah. And it, I, I think, cause it, it, you know, I appreciate him as an artist but I, I wouldn't say that he's you know, right. one of my favorites but right you know again when you see those types of works I went to the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam and it was just wow. like yeah you you're like okay this was pretty amazing <laughs> wow wow okay so you drew a lot you had a Van Gogh revelation yeah. um and then you just decided to go to art school yeah yep so well no yeah. i didn't decide to go to art school so i was like okay if i'm gonna go to college i really don't know about this art thing so i approached it very much like a farmer i don't want to invest a lot <laughs> so i went to slippery rock university in western pennsylvania and i could pay for it by bailing hay during the summer <laughs> like a tuition was that cheap you know oh, i was like the university that's how you pay tuition you bail hay yeah <laughs> But yeah, um, but, it's yeah. Okay, so when you so anyway, we're gonna fast forward because like you got your MFA, right? Yeah, you got your art stuff, you're doing yeah. your art thing. How did you connect? Like, were you planning to have your art revolve around farming and food? How did that uh, happen? How did that all. happen? So I had um always been fascinated by grafting like the the process of grafting and um so i had known about it through family so my great grandfather did it um for a living he worked in orchards and um everybody that talked about him they they spoke about like i had never met him but when they would tell me about him they talked about him as if he was kind of like this mystic because he had this capability and i always thought that was interesting because in a farming community like you it's not like you call the repair person right right like right. You, something breaks you have to fix it right so you're carpenter metal fabricator all of these things on top of farming and so they're pretty capable individuals and I always thought it was interesting because they would say like he knew how to graph so that stuck with me and I started you know it really started with like taking these pieces of plastic fruit and sticking them together. And then, Why? yeah, because I was like, oh, this is like grafting, right? So, um, you know, I did that about 500 times and then I was like, okay, I'm done with that. And then um, I thought, well, what if I could actually do this? And I knew with, um, I knew that you could graft vegetables together so anything that's in the same uh you know family you can generally graft together so i grafted um you know tomatoes peppers you know making all these i essentially made but what a are you garden. grafting are you grafting peppers with tomatoes or different types of tomatoes together that's oh. my symbol for grafting okay <laughs> <laughs> oh god i wish it was that easy <laughs> i could do that all that. um the uh no, it was like different vegetables together. So I had a whole garden growing off of like one root system. Oh my God. Right. So, and it, but the problem with that is like as an artwork, like it only lasts four months. Right, <laughs> like was, right. like, I put, you know, I put a year's worth of work into that and I'm like, oh, I don't, I really don't have anything. And then obviously I was like, okay, I need to start working with trees, you know, and then. Which is, okay, so that led into, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I got to know you from Tree of 40 Fruit. Like, I think that's your most well-known. So, so Sam, yeah. if you don't know who Sam is, he is a globally renowned artist oh, and Tree of 40 Fruit was sort of, from what I understand, what springboarded you to international acclaim. So tell everyone what it is 
and how you did it. Because seriously, you all have to Google this and okay. see <laughs> the, the pictures of it. No, it's so cool. It's so cool. But anyway, tell everyone about Trio 43. So it's a single tree that produces over 40 different type of stone fruit. So that's peaches, plums, apricots, nectarines, cherries, and almonds that all grow on one tree. Crazy. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's put together through the process of grafting. And the, you know, since each of the varieties that I work with has a slightly different blossom time, I can essentially design or shape how the tree blossoms in spring. So yeah, that, this is what blows my mind. You scientifically and mathematically figure out blooming, blossoming times. Yeah. And then you can also, you know, then it's, you know, so it has a, a pretty big, you know, they call it showy in the business, um, blossom in, in spring. And then it produces fruit from July into October. Yeah. So, so how... How many years have you been doing this now? Like, because it takes a while, obviously, for the trees to grow, to yeah. start to bear fruit. I saw some photos online. They are bearing fruit now. And how many oh, yeah. approximately do you have around the country, world? Where are they? So it's been 10. This is the 10th year I've been working on it. Oh, my yeah. God. I, yeah, it's like, I know. I'm sort of going, wow, what happened to my life? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, so, yeah, there's, I think there's, 40 or 41 trees at 25 different locations so some of them and there's a map have like multiple trees yeah and you have a map on your website and we'll put the website in the wherever you're watching in the comments or whatever um yeah. and they are producing fruit mm -hmm. that's so amazing yeah. it's so amazing yeah. and are any are they all private like how do you how do you do this because this is the thing that 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 like blew my mind. And I'd love to just touch on this a little is the difference between art, activism, art, farming, like where is the line between the two and how do you see your piece of work? Cause it's a piece of art, but it's also a fruit tree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting uh, up until I guess it's about five or six years ago. The first four years of the project, I was uh, making them primarily for art collectors. And, you know, it's, it was amazing because they kind of made the project possible, mm -hmm. right? It's um, their support kind of helped me get established and get going. But, you know, four years into it, I realized that like, I can't keep doing this in, in terms of it's an incredible amount of work to, to develop the trees. And, um, I go back and visit them for anywhere from three to five years. So wow. it was becoming a, a lot of work that for only a few people to see. And so then I started, uh, you know, as people would approach me about making one, I would say, would you be interested in sponsoring it in a public space? So that's sort of where the project shifted. And now I primarily do public spaces. Now, is this, so you... Tree of 40 fruit was the first one. That's 40 fruit. Now you're still working on open orchard. Tell people what open orchard and, and is that how it morphed? Like, is that how you went from tree of 40 fruit to open orchard? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I got about. What is it first? I guess. Like what is open orchard first? Oh, so the, op the open orchard is um, creating an uh, orchard of 50 to 150 trees. They're multi-grafted. So each of these will grow three or four different varieties. Um, and it's going to be planted on Governor's Island. And it's going to grow varieties that originated or were historically grown in New York City. And, and is that, with even the Tree of 40 fruit, I read somewhere about heirloom varieties. Like, tell us about how you found the actual fruits. Yeah, so I, it's interesting. So I would, um, the first couple of years of the project, I was scrambling to find all of these different varieties. And at that point, I um, realized sort of the extent to which, you know, we've narrowed all of these. You know, if you have a variety of fruit, industrial ag only wants to grow maybe 10 to a dozen different varieties and strange. So thing, like if you look at peaches, 
you know, before 1945, there were 2,000 different varieties of peaches grown in the U.S. Wow. Now we're down to several hundred that you would have access to, you know, or, or could get. Um, so in the process of creating the Tree of 40 Fruit, I amassed this collection of, you know, as orchards were being torn out, I would go in and collect varieties, graft them onto my trees. And, you know, again, like four years into the project, I realized that I had one of the largest collections of these fruits in the Eastern US. So that was a, like a big surprise to me. And some of the varieties, what they'll do, you know, the USDA, what they'll do to preserve varieties is they'll, um, a lot of times you can't keep them as living samples. So they take tissue culture and store them that way. And so I had some of the only living specimens of these varieties, which was terrifying. And yep. so, yeah, so then I kind of freaked out and then everything turned into preserving the varieties or getting them out to people right. so that they could actually taste them and, you know, appreciate them. So, yeah, I guess it was about five years ago. It, it really shifted to preserving these heirloom varieties. And that was the, the idea for the open orchard. And I'm going to be, I want to sound so stupid asking this. Um, I know like with pumpkins, I know how you save those seeds, but with like a, uh, uh, peach is it's the pit but can you save them in a box like you can or do they have to always be a tree it always has to be a tree yeah because wow. um fruit trees are are genetically unstable right uh so what happens is if you take say you took a hundred seeds off of a peach tree planted them out um you would get a hundred different trees I mean, they, some might really closely resemble the parent, um, but some might have, you know, different characteristics. And it's all, you know, it's a natural sort of adaptability trait, uh, but apples are kind of the worst. Like they're the most unstable. You but plant- I'm Wait, I'm confused. So does one plant the pit or does one graft? To you have to- yeah, so to preserve the varieties, you have to graft. Oh. So, I, I mean, that, which is interesting because there's varieties I, I have that date back at least two, 3,000 years. That means that oh my God. someone has grafted them every 20 or 30 years, right? So, over and over and over across a millennia or several millennia, somebody has taken that variety, grafted it onto a new root structure. So in a weird way, you feel like you're just, I'm just a placeholder in time. Like I'm no, just wait. somebody else that's adding to that. But you know how they have the finding your roots show? This really is finding your roots. You could trace the, if somebody could trace a tree back through the grafters, how cool would that be? I you could learn the whole. It, like Go I ahead. trace them back through history where it's sort of, uh, there's like strange things where, um, so there was this, I think he was an ambassador from England, um, took three peach seeds that, from an orchard that he found outside of Shanghai, sent them to England. The researcher there really didn't know what to do with them. So he sent them to a friend of his who was in, um, in South Carolina. So this guy plants them, grows the trees out. The tree is known as Chinese cling, and it becomes the parent of over 60% of the peaches that we grow in the U.S. Huh. Like it's just weird. And so you can follow all that. Well, that's the other thing that makes the open orchard really interesting is the, is the story of the varieties. Okay, but let's go back to open orchard because I got very yeah. excited and went off on tangents. So tree of 40 fruit morphed to open orchard because you wanted to have more public accessibility. So tell us what that yeah. is, where you're at with it. COVID obviously impacted yeah. it. So yep. tell us about it. So um, we started the trees uh, by grafting them uh, in 2018. So uh, we created a nursery. We were intending on planting this year, but with COVID, it just became uh, too difficult. And then, um, yeah, so we're hoping to plant by next next year. Yeah. Um, so what do you so but 
tell us what you're planning. So you, you have these trees, you, you crafted three to four different varieties of heirloom fruits from yeah. the New York yeah, area. Yeah, they're all fruit trees. Yeah. So it's interesting because New York is, you could argue that it's like the home of fruit growing in the United States. Um, there was, uh, you know, so, I mean, before Europeans showed up, the Lene Lenape were cultivating beach plums, mm. uh, Prunus Maritima uh, along the Hudson. And then as the first Dutch came to explore the Hudson River, uh, they gave peach seeds to the, to the Lene Lenape, and then they cultivated those up and down the Hudson. Huh. So then the first sort of governor of uh, Manhattan planted a pear tree that was it that grew in manhattan for like 220 years died in like 1850 oh. um but then as people started to come from all over the world they would bring fruit with them uh so those could be seeds or potted plants and it, it was this sort of connection to their home mm. and so you have all of these varieties coming through the city and at the time it was you know man new york city was the lower tip of Manhattan and everything around it was farmland and so these trees yeah there's probably well maybe nearly a hundred varieties that originated in New York I'd say there's only a few dozen that are actually left and living that you can find but I was yeah. gonna say how did you find them now to graft onto these trees that you've created a lot of it is through uh the USDA yeah, in fact, all of it pretty much is is through the USDA because they have a national germplasm program. Well, what is a national germplasm program? <laughs> yeah, so what they do is like they actually go out and collect, try to find these rare varieties, and so they've uh, they've been trying to to build up. And there was an interesting story that came out. I think it was last spring, uh, in. Oregon there's there is some guys from California they're these sort of apple finders so they go out and they try to find old rare varieties and in an orchard in Oregon they found this variety called the streaked pippin which originated in Flushing Queens oh my god and was taken all the way out to Oregon and planted so it's interesting yeah so wait now do you have any street pippin no, I'm, that one, it's going to be a couple of years before it becomes available. Like they okay. have to, so as the germplasm collects it, then they start to, um, then they test it for viruses and make sure it's clean. And then they, um, you know, they'll make it available. We'll be back in a minute with our guest today, Sam Van Aken. But right now, let's check in with our health and wellness expert, Chef Ebeth Johnson, to see what she's got cooking up for us today. Chef Ebeth? Hi everyone, it's Ebeth Johnson here, your mindful eating coach and wellness mentor. So happy to see you today. In a few short weeks, it will be holiday season. We'll be celebrating Thanksgiving. And while this Thanksgiving and holiday season will be unlike any that the majority of us have experienced, we still want to focus on our health and wellness and gratitude during this holiday season. So what I want to share with you today are a couple of my quick tips for staying healthy during the holidays. Now, one of the biggest challenges around Thanksgiving, of course, is overeating and sabotaging our success with this one meal for which many of us look forward to all year. I'm one of them. And even though I really look forward to this time of year and all the family favorites and all of the recipes that I cook once a year, I still strive to stay in alignment as much as possible with my weight and wellness goals. And I wanna help you to do the same too without losing anything in the enjoyment of the holiday, right? We can be healthy and happy at the same time. So my first tip is, I notice that a lot of people before a big meal or party will tend to try to not eat during the day prior to in an attempt to save calories. This is not a good idea. We all know what we are like when we are hangry. We do not make good meal choices. 
and we're not the most pleasant guests. So I encourage you to actually eat normally throughout the day before your Thanksgiving meal so that you don't arrive hangry and in the mindset where you can't really make a good decision for yourself about what to eat. Now, when it comes time for loading up your plate, I encourage you to first choose a smaller plate. Choose the smallest plate that you possibly can and use that instead of a larger plate because of course, a larger plate means larger portions and it also tricks the eye a bit and makes whatever you put on your plate look smaller. So you'll inevitably put more food on your plate than you need to eat. Not more food than you could eat because you probably could eat it and enjoy it, but you probably don't really want to, right? Okay, so uh, don't wait to eat. Use a smaller plate. And then when you start filling up your plate, begin with veggies. Fill your plate with vegetables first. Whatever are your favorite veggies that are on offer, fill up your plate with those first and then add on the meats and the starches like the mac and cheese, the sweet potatoes, the um, mashed potatoes, the stuffing, etc. So first half to three quarters of your plate full of whatever vegetables are available and then use the little space that's left for your animal products and your starches. That will help you create a good balance on your plate that serves and support your wellness goals even on Thanksgiving Day. Now, many of us go back for seconds and maybe even thirds when it comes to Thanksgiving, right? So here's what I want you to do before you go back for seconds or thirds. First, I call it water and wait, okay? So before you go back for seconds, what I want you to do is drink a full glass of water. Not a little tiny cup, like eight to 10 ounces. Drink eight to 10 ounces of water and then wait. Wait 10 to 15 minutes. Oftentimes, the water and the weight allows you the time and the space that you need to realize that you're probably not even hungry and it can even um, settle some of those cravings that you may have for seconds that you don't really need. Um, so I encourage you to do that. But if after the water and the weight, you still want more, fine, go back for seconds. But again, start with veggies first eat those, and then if you still want more, you can go back for all the other fixings that you really enjoy. Um, and that's it. So choose a small plate, eat your veggies first, water and wait. And I said this one first actually, but remember to eat throughout the day. Don't wait until the end of the day to eat because you'll be hangry and you won't make good choices. So I'm so happy to see you. I hope you have a fantastic holiday season. Until I see you again, live deliciously, and I'll talk to you next time. Thanks so much, Ebeth. And now let's get back to our conversation with Sam Van Aken. Open orchard, three to four different types of fruit on one tree. The uh, nursery is on Governor's mm -hmm. Island. Yep. And then what is the plan as i mentioned there's going to be 50 to anywhere from 50 to 150 we're trying to figure out you know how many we'll be able to plant um but the remaining trees that we don't use um will go out to community gardens in new york city and so what i'm trying to do is match uh the varieties uh no. with community no. gardens where they originated yeah so that's sort oh, of the that's other so thing. cool yeah. Do you have any gardens lined up? I do through, um, so I've been doing a bunch of workshops through Green Thumb this year. Mm -hmm. So we've been, we've been like doing like a year of Tree of 40 Fruit. So we, it's been odd this year because everything is in my backyard. So it's on pruning and grafting and pest control. And we even did some canning, you know, like canning peaches and that sort of thing. Um, so is that publicly available or is that you had to take the class to get the videos? I have no idea. I have to look into that. Of course that you don't. He's, a, I don't, he's an I don't artist, even, everyone. I don't even know because I never watch anything that I do. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I, yeah, like once I do it, it goes into the ether and it never bothers me. If I watch it, it I have to revisit the trauma. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm but, really um, glad to know I'm traumatizing you today. Yeah, exactly. No, <laughs> you're not because I'm not watching it, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like, it's pretty interesting. So um, there's the street, South Street, that's right by the Governor's Island Ferry. So um, it's like 1783, 
somebody's walking by uh, one of the buildings, is eating an old mix and peach, which is like one of the oldest peaches in the US, takes a seed, throws it between the buildings, it grows, somebody tastes it and is like, this is amazing. Uh, the tree becomes world famous. Like it's grown around the world. It's called George the Fourth. Uh, it almost disappears and the USDA saves it, brings it back. And so we're growing that tree on Governor's Island and we're gonna place it back in a community garden as close as we can to South Street. So that's kind of an example. That is so cool. You know what? I'm just feeling Hamilton. We need a whole musical about fruit trees. <laughs> I don't know. Like I already I think know. I'm in like way too deep. On this. I mean, not you. You hire like a Lynn Manuel Miranda yeah. to do it. That's yeah. Um, so are do you? I know COVID completely impacted your plans. Do you have any feeling? Or are you waiting? to see where COVID goes on when the plannings will happen. Like, well, do you think yeah. it will happen 2021? I'm hopeful, but yeah, you know, it, it's like everything is, it's tough. It, it's really, well, a lot of it also is just sort of my teaching job at Syracuse. I mean, they've done amazing. We've had, we've met in person for all of no. the classes. Yeah. How do you do that? So, so you're an associate professor of arts. Tell people a little yeah. bit about that and what you're doing. Um, yeah, so I started uh, teaching sculpture, really. And then oh. as then it's kind of evolved into teaching art theory and professional practices and um, <laughs> Sam, you know, you're you're all grown up. I know, I, yeah, I have you <laughs> I know, I'm like, God, that sounds so like yeah, when you say it. Uh, <laughs> um <laughs> uh, no, but it, it's great. And then I teach, um, so I primarily teach graduate students, but this year I'm teaching this arts and context class, uh, which is for first year students. And I'm loving it. Right? Really? It's, it's sort of like an art survey, but you, you're trying to contextualize how, like a lot of times when art history is taught, it spends very little time talking about the era, the time that it's made, the artists, like the influences that actually shape the work. And right. So it, it's fantastic teaching this class, you know, it's first years plus, you know, they get really excited quick, so it's good. But that could partially because they're locked in their dorm rooms. <laughs> but how have you had, how have you had in class, you've had in class Yeah, classes? so they, yeah, they had, um, I mean, they handled it amazing. I was really apprehensive this summer and I was like, oh no, how long this is gonna last. But they, every student had to show up with a negative COVID test in August. They immediately had to take a test after they arrived. And then they had uh, random testing throughout the semester. And we haven't had more than uh, somewhere around 90 cases at any given time. Wow. And, and how many students, you're at Syracuse. So, and this is upstate yeah. New York. So it's, this is not New York yeah. City, everyone. Um, but how many students is it? Tens of thousands? Yeah. Yeah, it's no, a huge, well, it's a huge university, but it's not like a community college. Like it's a big Yeah, I mean there's university. they accept fourteen thousand undergrad a year, but then we have a disproportionate graduate population, which I think is somewhere between eight to ten thousand. Wow, and, so it is massive. Well, I hope oh, other really I, not, yeah. I hope other universities start modeling whatever they're doing. Yeah, I yeah, it was, I'm, I'm amazed. Yeah, they did a great job. I mean, it's so, God, it's like the worst semester ever for teaching though, because you're, I'm teaching in person and I have Zoom open so people can, you know, oh. connect to the class. But then I have to offer a whole asynchronous part of the class. I'm like, how did this class turn into three classes? So, but, yeah, you know, it's good. It, it, Graph after, them, Sam. Graph yeah, your, no, your little segments no. <laughs> together. <laughs> exactly. It's a, I'm, I'm good at editing. <laughs> um, it was good to come back in August, though. You know, so sort of just being isolated for four months, even though you're wearing a mask and, you know, you smell like hand sanitizer right. all day. It was, it was nice. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, okay. So 
that's your professor side and then you have mm -hmm. your artist side and then you have your farmer side so do you what do you see yourself as of one third one third one third do you feel more farmer when you're grafting more a professor when you're teaching like <laughs> yeah i mean i wouldn't denigrate farmers by saying what i do is farming i mean i i do have like the luxury of um you know, I, I don't have to depend on my trees producing fruit to live off of. You right? were and a think, farmer then. I'll say you were a farmer. I'm not yeah, for someone like yeah. me who has very little, I'm not a rural person. To me, you at least were a farmer. Yeah. And I mean, that's like a very different, no, we, it, and it's, I don't think there's people that I have more respect for. It, I mean, they, I remember we used to, you know, you put all your money into seeds and you stick them in the ground and, you know, you're just crossing your fingers that the weather's good. Right. I mean, it well, be... and look, Sam, come on. Yeah. It's I, in my research, you know, I have this whole thing, plant each chair, which I am, mm -hmm. I am going to make Sam give me a tree or two when I get some <laughs> my own gardens up just so everyone knows. So you're going to have to send him letters and bug him. Um, but because of that, I, I done research on like, planting a tree it's not mm -hmm. just throwing seeds in the ground farmers are like probably the most intelligent people on the planet yeah oh no and then you have to like have like a really broad skill set too i mean you're right. running a business right. then you're also right. and now it's at a level i can't even fathom where everything is um automated right so mm -hmm. like as they're planting seeds now they have mapped the terrain, they know the, the moisture of the soil, they know the pH, and they have it down to where, you know, in particular spots, they'll plant a particular seed that's going to perform well there. You know, so wow. if it's on a slope going down into a ditch, it's all right. satellite controlled that drops it in. They Now they've become computer hackers because a lot now of the big tractor companies have very sophisticated programming and they want you to use their people to fix it and so farmers are like i'm not gonna pay somebody so they're hacking the computer it's great oh. it's, it's like super but wild. is this is this like a regenerative farmer or an industrial farmer like what kind of farmer is using this is this everybody i always thought regenerative farmers are out in the field like hippies not i'm not putting uh, down on yeah what I'm no, into it. i mean and that's that's kind of like the unfortunate part of like the food system in in terms of you know to really make a profit you either have to have an item that sells for an extraordinary amount of money right i know a guy that sells apricots in union square market for like six bucks an apricot right? which to me sounds and they probably sell out right and they yeah, probably exactly. sell out yeah i'm like yeah. six bucks for that i grow those like weeds around here um or you have to to farm on a mass scale right i mean and a lot of that is just because of pricing i mean i looked at the you know how so they weigh milk the the quantity of milk is they call it the hundred pound or the hundred weight and uh in sort of the mid 1980s you would get 14 dollars for a hundred weight of milk you get the same amount now right so wow. we're almost looking at 40 years later wow so that's why when you you know it, it's a lot of it is people too they're like um oh, you know milk can't be more than 329 in a gallon or you know that sort of thing and like yeah that price regulation has forced people to essentially become a factory like the the family farms disappeared so if you're doing sort of artisanal crops organic heirloom crops you can operate on a smaller scale uh but yeah, I mean, there's really fine lines and, and margins in those, in those businesses. So. Okay, I'm getting depressed now. Okay. Yeah, I don't, yeah, let's talk about um, you. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about fruit tree. No, I mean, that's a bad topic. Let's talk about fruit trees. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Do so you make pies? Things. Oh my God. Wait, Elaine Tignal, she was making those with the cherry pies. You kind of like part, even though she's in France. Yeah. You could have like a whole pie eating thing. Uh, well, she was making sausages, right? For a while. Oh my God, I went to the VA. Okay, I'm sorry, yeah. everyone, this is going to bore you, but I went to the Victoria and Albert Museum when I was in London last year to see Fallen Fruit. Austin and yeah. um, David had like a big part of the exhibition on food. And there's Lane and her pigs in cans. Like it was amazing because I always thought, so this woman, Elaine Tinya, she's amazing. Yeah. She got a grant to follow hogs from birth to your stomach, basically. And she went to France to do this. And I was like, okay, it's great. But she's an artist. I'm like, what is she doing? Well, well when I went into the Victorian Albert, like she took the leftover stuff that's normally thrown away and it was in cans and the way it was all done. I'm like, this is amazing. Oh, that's great. I have to check that yeah. out. To, yeah. Um, yeah, there's, well, part of what we're doing on Governor's Island is it's, so as much as it's the orchard, I mean, obviously it's about the orchard and having people come and taste these fruit, you know, it's that experience in and of itself is mind boggling, right? Because you're, you're like, wow, these things actually have a taste to them. It isn't just sugar. Right. And right. Um, so there's obviously that, but then there's also a lot of public programming that we plan on doing around it. So uh, having workshops on how to plant, grow, prune, and care for a tree. Uh, and then also through the research. So as I've been uh, researching the history, history of these varieties, I found that there's been specific recipes written about, or you know, specifically for each variety. And so we're going to partner with with local chefs to recreate some of these dishes. So, Perfect. yep, I'm there. I hope I'm getting an invitation. Yeah, Everyone's absolutely. Everyone's invited. Everyone's invited <laughs> to Sam's fruit tastings. Everybody can come. Um, up. Yeah. So, is there anything else? Is there anything else you're working on? I saw online, which I didn't know about the grafting. You had packages of seeds that you oh grafted. yeah. What is sure. that? Yeah, I was just doing those as sort of like, a, yeah, I was taking seed packets and just sort of creating collages with those. Um, but oh, so you weren't, because I thought maybe you were doing it from the trees that you were grafting. You were taking packets of those varieties and turning them into um, no, no, art. No, but I, I am, um, so I'm working on my own herbarium. So I'm taking all the varieties and creating pressings of them. And then creating what pressings? Yeah, explain pressings. this to people who don't know. Pressing is when you used to put a leaf in a book, yeah, and like shut the exactly. book. Exactly. Okay. Except I'll take whole branches. Like, <laughs> oh my them. god! And what so do I you have, do? Stick them so in a vice? Yeah, and I have this like nineteenth-century book press that I like crank them down, and they stay in there for a couple of weeks till they dry out. Then they get sewn onto a board. Hold on. Wait one second. Okay. Oh, this is so exciting. He's going to show us a pressing. Or he just ran away because he's tired of talking to us. And he really oh, went I'm trying to find away. it. Yeah, oh. I, I like took off. Hold on, wait. I'm... <laughs> Where is Sam? So that's what they look like as they're finished. Right? That so is they so have beautiful. The, the blossom, the leaf, and then like they'll have a packet that holds the seed. And then it has like the information on it, that sort of thing. Um, He's so creative. But with those, it, you know, that came out of just like the anxiety of growing these trees. And I'm like, oh my God, what if I lose them? Right. You know, <laughs> I would be or, the same way. <laughs> you know, in years from now, like what if these varieties disappear? I'll still have that, um, you know, specimen. But you couldn't grow from what you're doing. No, can you? no, but you could, well, the seed will be there. So it'll, you know, you can at least uh, trace the DNA. So. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You're, you're, so, you're, you're amazing, Sam Van Aken. So, okay, I'm switching and we're going to be wrapping up soon, but I, okay. I'm just curious because you, you know, you're outside of Metropolis, you're upstate. Like, what do you see or where do you think the world is going to go post pandemic? What do you see sort of happening over the next few years? 
I mean, it's actually kind of interesting because um, people from New York started to move up here. <laughs> I'm like, no. do you know how cold it is here? <laughs> Not with climate change. <laughs> Got, yeah, how about it? Um, I heard this story about this. Um, I don't know if I told you, this is totally a rumor. There's no, you know, this is just what I heard. Um, I've heard that uh, peach growers from Georgia have started to buy land along the Great Lakes because that area along the Great surprised. Lakes, yeah, anticipating climate change. Yeah, yeah and even yeah, now, it's... because, I mean, I don't know growing temperatures, but um, when I was in Michigan, there's a lot of wineries, you know, obviously there's cherries and stuff, but I think people don't know, because there's a, there's like a moderate belt. Oh, yeah, I'm not yeah. A farmer people, don't let me talk about this stuff well that's what so, new york city is subtropic now just damn close right it, the grow zones have increased might be able to grow citrus there on the island yeah you <laughs> might <kidding>. I, <laughs> no i think somebody i know is growing limes in brooklyn I, yeah. you'd be surprised it's like a swamp here anymore it's, yeah it's and it's been in the 70s and it's almost mid-november so it's yeah I don't know, it scares me um Anyway, anything else you want to share with us? Final words of wisdom from Sam Van Aken. I have no words of wisdom. Oh, no, but uh, for, I think the interesting thing that we're seeing is as sort of metropolitan areas get dispersed, I actually think it could be a good thing for food and food production, right? Because it's where demand is meeting production. Right, what you mean by and people it, leaving? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think some of the culture, New York City has all of the culture of food. And I think, you know, as people did. get closer, <laughs> did. it did. did. <laughs> Restaurants. But as, yeah. But as people, you know, go to other places, they're going to want that, you know, to carry that culture of food with them. Yeah. I think it's great if they're meeting the people that are actually producing it. So, well, I, I am interested to see how many like chefs and people within the food space move to other areas. Like I, I planned a whole trip through Utah just to eat at Hell's Backbone Grill, which is in this tiny, oh, that's fantastic. tiny spot. Oh yeah. And I specifically went just to eat at that place, but I mean, it was the most amazing road trip because Southern Utah is stunning. I just wonder if more places. And I remember once driving through Kanab and we just randomly stopped off for lunch and the guy been a chef i think he said in new york city like one of the best meals of my life affordable and you're there like you can you can eat in the gardens of where food is grown that's being put on your plate so yeah. it'll be interesting to see i worry about new york city but it'll it's come back survived. yeah you know, it's always survived now or, artists yeah. might actually be able to live there for a couple months before rents go back up so but that might not well, be that's, bad yeah, I've heard that in some of the leases, they're putting clauses that they can raise the rent back up to market value at any time. Yeah. But there's really good deals right now. But yeah. anyway, okay, let's not end on that note. What's your okay. favorite pie? What's your favorite pie? And have uh, you made it? This is like, uh, this is the perfect time. No, I haven't made it. But um, favorite pie is this thing called shoe fly pie. Oh. I'm totally on this like grandmother. Wait, thing. is this Lancaster? Yeah. Is this Lancaster PA? Yeah. Because yeah. so I had like it when I was younger. Molasses and crumbs and I don't even know what's in it. But the reason why it's my favorite. So <laughs> I was driving by this. I was, dri I was just driving up here and um, I saw this Amish guy on the side of the road. And um, where I grew up, we were surrounded by Amish farms, right? So this guy has like all of these pies out and all this food and I um you know I start talking with him and he's like do you know Dutch I'm like a little and you know so we're talking and I was just like oh my god but for the grace of god I would be this guy right <laughs> and then I asked him I was like um I was like do you have shoe fly pie and then it was like we bonded yeah it was really a moment so his wife made me a shoe fly pie <gasps> it was like yeah special oh my order god. so um, oh, yeah, wow. I just had that last week. So <gasps> I haven't had that in years. And yes, it's otherwise known as crack pie. Yeah. Once you take a bite, you can't, you just got to keep going back. Yeah, there, it's it really is. Good. It's just like, uh, but yeah. I don't think there's any fruit in it. 
Oh, there's no fruit in that. No, but I mean, if I was, <laughs> I mean, cherry pies are amazing. Like the ones you get in Michigan are like, oh, you know. There's a, where was I in Michigan? I can't remember the the town I was in, the city. I think it might've been Traverse City. Anyway, there's a sh- pie yeah. shop. Oh, and yeah. I bought, there was like 12 types of cherry pie. I got a slice of each. And just- yeah. <laughs> it's, I, they're like, it's amazing up there. It's, it's really. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So. Okay, so how can people find out more about your work? Oh, probably my website, but then also on the, the Governor's Island website, there's information on the Open Orchard. And if they can't uh, figure that out, if they just go to samvanaken.com, you have a yep. link to Governor's Island. I think so. I got to look into that. <laughs> I know, this is great. <laughs> Sam's like a real artist farmer. He doesn't know. He's not a social like, media guy. I am so happy to not be on social media after this election. I'm uh, like, you know. Yeah. No, it's it's that and just to promote something like promoting each show takes days. It used to be very simple. Now it's so, oh, I hate it. I'm going back to pen and, yeah. or pencil and paper. Forgot even pens. Pencil and it, paper. It takes, people to, uh, it takes people a while to find you, but then it's like actually good after that. You know? Right. Thank you so much, Sam. There will be more information on how to get in touch with Sam in the comments. Yeah, thank you. Many thanks to our guest today, Sam Van Aken. And thank you for joining us at Change Food Eats. We air new shows on the first and third Tuesday of every month. Um, And you can catch all of the previous episodes on YouTube, Instagram TV, the Change Food Facebook page, and on the Change Food website at changefood.org. We'll see you next time. And until then, eat well.